Hello, hope you're all okay and dealing with what we're going through the best that you can and looking after yourselves. I for one have felt like this has been a really long winter and I'm so looking forward to getting outside and enjoying the season in the garden. Things are coming out of the ground and I don't know, it puts a smile on your face, doesn't it? And everything starts to feel a little bit more positive. I think last year, one of the things that blew me away, a couple of the gardeners' wells that I hosted when Monty couldn't, was the reaction. The amount of people that were getting so much out of their garden, but also new gardeners. And what also was interesting, so many more people going back and growing their own veg. And that's what I want to talk about today. I'm obviously going to grow my veg as per normal in my veg garden, but I'm going to do a lot more sort of ornamental veg gardening this year. And what I mean by that is I think that some people, you know, might commit totally to a veg garden, but also some might not necessarily have the space. But then on top of that, there's no reason why we can't plant our veggies in our borders, you know. And I suppose I'm going to show you a few different bits and, bits and pieces that, that sort of guide you you know, and hopefully give you a little bit of inspiration and help you through the next few months. So, cracking on, um, the first thing I'm gonna grow is, is Swiss chard. I grew a load last year, even actually in reality, I had a feed off it yesterday afternoon, so I went out and cut it, grown all the way through the winter. And what's great about chard is, is you can sow it probably from now all the way through to July. You can harvest it more or less all the way through the year. I've got some in the garden that I planted last year that actually I know that I'm gonna be able to get another good couple of feeds out of it before maybe it goes to seed. So, you know, it's a really good, reliable plant. But what I've done here is I've got a Swiss chard that's got a mixture of colors right through from whites, yellows, and reds. And I'm gonna sow them not directly into the ground, but you could do that this time of year. You could put them straight out. And I'm gonna sow some carrots in a minute. and. Hopefully that will be the same process. So, you know, you can treat the chard the same way as the carrots. But what I'm gonna do, sorry, sorry about the hat, but it's holding the hair in place. It's, it's a little bit long. Um, I'm gonna sew it in individual pots. I'm using these little sort of, they're about sort of nine centimeter pots, but actually in reality, you know, you could grow it straight into sort of modules, something like that. What we're gonna do is, is fill the pot up initially. And if you imagine, all I've got here is, is multi-purpose peat-free peat compost. They're not gonna need a lot more than that. So we've, sorry, hold on, I'm throwing it around. Fill the pot up, nice and simple, and then boom, boom, a little bit more on top, a couple of taps. I don't actually go ramming it down or anything like that. So once I've filled my pots up, I then water them. So I've actually got some here that are, that are pre-watered. And why I'm sowing it, in pots is because as i've said you know we we grow you know we grow i don't know we grow edible rhubarb we grow ornamental rhubarb we grow edible currants we grow ornamental currants why not start to interplant and some of the ways that i design with plants is not just about color of flower it's about color of and texture of foliage so i think these are a fantastic plant you know maybe to use front of the border interplanted but at the same time you could grow it in a container but also happy in the veg garden and you know, we buy hostas massive big leaves on them admittedly you know the slugs love them as well these have got you know that same interesting leaf so when i tap the seeds out here you actually see they're, they're quite sort of when you have a go at this you'll find that they're a cluster of seeds so you might find that, that when you sow something it doesn't just come up as one colour. But all I'm going to do here is go about centimetre, centimetre and a half, I suppose, little holes in the middle, so they're all pre-watered. And again, you know, all this guidance is on the back of the packets and, and if you go a little bit deeper and a little bit shallow, it doesn't really matter. Most things want to grow and they're good. And again, if you've never really grown veg before, for me, this is this is a plant that you won't have many problems with. You know, it, it works really well. Great fun to do with the kids. And and even when you're cooking it, you know, I had it yesterday and it was just sauteed down. I just used the leaves. But on top of that, you can use the stems, cooking them slightly separately. 
fantastic. And then all I'm doing, look, is sieving over the top just to fill those holes. One little tap on top of that. And then they'll get labelled and they'll go in the greenhouse. But you could put them against a nice sheltered wall on a windowsill just to get them going. And I'll now grow those on probably until about May time. And then what I'll do if they're in the greenhouse, I'll slowly harden them off. So what that means is they might come out during the day and then go back in in the evening. What you're trying to do is toughen the plant up so you don't shock it when you plant out straight out into the garden. Yeah, it's a bit like us this time of year. You know, you've got the coat on at the moment, but you know, maybe next week it's still sweatshirt and then eventually we work to the t-shirt. Same principle. In fact, actually, I think a lot I equate plants to human beings and it's not a bad way to garden. Really, if you think about what these need um, and they think about what human need, beings need, it's not that different, really. Anyway, that's sort of a subject. So they're sown, they'll get watered in a few days, and what you'll do as they start to shoot and grow, just regularly water. What this gives me that opportunity, I can now decide that actually, look, the ones that come up red, I'm going to put those out into the border. The ones that come up yellow, I'm going to use those maybe in a lovely container, you know, and the white ones. I'm going to use those maybe in the veg garden. So that's why I'm doing it like that. It just gives me that sort of opportunity to use these plants in various different ways. And they say you don't need a veg garden for those. They'll happily grow in a container. Next one up is squash. Um, I don't know about you, but I always um, tend to grow too many courgettes. So I'm trying to ease up on the courgettes this year. But what I love about squash is, is again, the amount of different ways that you can cook with them. Um, we had them a couple of weeks ago, just roasted down with some nice sort of hot spices like, you know, chilies and cumin and things like that. Slow roasted them um, with a little bit of curry sauce on top. That actually, my daughter who stood behind the camera, she's now laughing and smiling, called Abby Jade. Um, she makes this fantastic curry sauce. So she did the curry sauce to go on top of them. They're great, absolutely. Yeah. There you go. She's joining this. She'll never come this side of the camera, but she's probably, if it's shaking now, that's because she's laughing. All right. So... Again, squashes grow fantastic in containers, um, you know, in the borders, in raised beds. Um, they flower, that looks interesting. But once they do flower and they start to form those roots, you've got to make sure that they're well watered. But same principle. Yeah, if you imagine, fill the pots the same. And I would tend to go for pots now with the squash rather than something like, you know, the little module trays. Um, the difference with these is just going to be really the depth of planting. So if I can find my pencil, I'm now going to go down to probably about four or five centimetres into that pot. So I'm holding my pencil at roughly what I think is that depth, just to hold that, keep the distance exactly the same. And these seeds you'll recognise straight away if you've ever taken a squash apart, is that it's the bit that you scoop out in the middle. So all we're going to do now is drop those in. And if they don't drop straight to the bottom, just give them a little bit of a helping hand with your finger. Put those back in there. A bit more soil on top with my sieve. Fill those holes in. And at the same time, I'm just topping up my pots. And these will have the same thing. So you could put them on a windowsill, um, grow on. Sometimes, depending on how quick these grow, because I've started them early, I might even pot them on before I eventually put them out in the garden. But last year we did some of these just in containers, um, you know, around the patio. And it worked really, really well. Um, and it's lovely, you know, the squash is growing out the side of the pots. But again, happy in the veg garden. Same principle, you'll grow them on. These will be planted out again, probably May time. But I will use that hardening off process. So they'll get grown on and then they'll just get hardened up before they're planted out into the main garden. I'm going to talk about adding organic matter in a minute to the main veg garden. So that, boom, sets us up and we're away. So the next thing we're going to do is do some direct sowing in the veg garden. See you in a second. Right, so now we're on to the carrots. Who doesn't love a carrot, eh? Last year on Garden as well, I planted some in an old, old container that I found in the shed and it worked really well. So I know carrots work well in containers. Again front of the borders but here we're in the main veg garden you might notice straight away this bed here has been well manured this hasn't so that's the first thing I'm going to do with the carrots I'm going to plant them in places 
that hasn't had a lot of manure. They don't need that in a sense. It can make them sort of fork and, and you don't need that really sort of fresh manure. So these, this bed um, was manured last year. It's grown some stuff on it. This is really suitable. So what I'm gonna do, first of all, is just create myself a little drill. And all you'll see I'm doing is just sliding my trowel along. And my drill's about, about a centimetre deep. No deeper than that. What's great about carrots is ultimately you can sow them right from what now through to July. So a lot of time sort of little and often is a good approach. But at the same time, you know, carrots will store well. So we get to the back end of the season. I leave mine in the ground for a while. But then if I feel they need to come out, just keeeping them, you know, washing them, keeping them in a dry bag in the dark or even, you know, some sort of clean sand and um, keeps them going for ages. And we had carrots out of the garden that I'd stored this Christmas. Sorry about the hat, it keeps slipping down. I can't wait to have air cut, I'll be honest with you. But it's interesting, Mrs. Frost quite likes it, you know, long, so I'm never gonna be able to have short hair again. Anyway, back to the carrots. So I've done my little drill, and the next thing I'm gonna do is just carefully, just pre-water that drill. So all I'm doing is working my way along and just filling it out with water. So why we're doing that really is it means that they're gonna really fix themselves down. We're not then covering a load of water on top and washing the seeds everywhere. You'll find with your carrot seeds, they're a little bit smaller than the chard that we were just sowing. And actually I said about the chard, didn't I, you know, that you could sow directly and follow the back of the packet, but it's the same principle really. You would be sowing ultimately into a drill and the same principle as it matures. So what I'm gonna do here is just carefully work my way along, just thinly using my fingers really, just to run the seeds down. The odd one does go astray a little bit. Do you know, I'm getting to that age where I'm gonna to have to start wearing glasses to do this. I can see the seed, but at times they look a little blurry, but don't tell anyone that really. So there we go, they're so. Then we just go along and then fill in that back. And then what I'll do now is I'll label that up. But what I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna cover this bed. Well, I'll cover this bed. I'm actually gonna sow the rest of this when you guys have gone. But if you're just doing one drill is to say, what you wanna do, this time of year for a couple of reasons, early fleece will help keep that warmth in there but also I have problems in this garden with carrot fly and this growing under this fleece right through the season will help protect them from the carrot fly and so what I'm going to do is use these little supports these will go in around the bed and then I'll wrap it up and I'll fix it down really really tightly and that will help not only push them on but then it will help with that carrot fly and then we come across here so this bed has been it has been sort of well manured and what have I been gardening here? Probably four years, I reckon now. And this is the first year I'm gonna sort of have a bit more of a no dig approach. So what I mean by that is I'm not gonna disturb the soil, but that relies an awful lot on the mulching. Um, it's an interesting concept, no dig, because I think I was always trying to turn the soil, get the goodness in. And, and actually in reality, the more we've learned about our soils, you know, not to disturb, let the plants do the work, get the food on top, works well. But I think you've got to be in a place where you're confident your soil is good enough to start with. And, and I think it's taken me a while to build, you know, build the soils to a place that, I don't know, I used to work for Jeff Hamilton many years ago and he would always say, you know, the soil's in good heart. So what I'm gonna sow over here is rocket. I think rocket, same thing, look, I'm putting this little drill along, about the same depth, I always find my rocket, I prefer to grow my rocket sort of beginning of the season and then the back end of the season. Um, then it doesn't tend to go to bolt, but then on top of that, I do grow wild rocket, which doesn't bolt as quick as some of the others. When you get really hot weather, you know, your rocket plants can go to seed very quickly. So interestingly, as you're growing it through the season, you know, the more we get into the season, if you can find a corner space in the old veg garden, you know, or in a border or in a container 
you know, you've got more chance of getting a good feed out of it. And what I love about the wild rocket is that you can cut it, you know, and it will come again. We grew some last year in a block of one of these and it kept us going, you know, the whole season. But I did it on a, on a really north facing wall. Whereas this bed here is a little bit more open. So it'll be interesting to see what the difference you know, is even sort of five, six yards away. It's fascinating when you're gardening and, and working out where to put things in your garden. And I was waffling a lot about microclimates and people look at me a little bit gone out, I think. And actually, you know, it's mind blowing how even a few degrees here and a few degrees there in your own garden will make a massive difference. And, and veggies react a lot to changing temperature you know, cold wind on the on the wrong night. So getting to understand your garden is really important. So, well, rocket, same thing really. No, yeah, I have pre-watered it, I've not. I'm trying to concentrate, do half a dozen things at once, you know. So, rocket again, I'm gonna sow quite thinly, put it out into my hand, and then just working my way along. And if you go a bit heavy here and there, same with the carrots. Now what you'll do as, as plants sort of tend to grow, you know, you can thin them out. So you can just thin things out and just give everything a little bit more room. You know, with your carrots, I tend to feed on them earlier. So what I'll do is I'll let them get to sort of what we call, you know, baby carrots and then on to mature. And that's another thing with veg garden. No, just experiment, have some fun with it. Don't. You know, all right, follow what it says on the packet, but then also maybe sow a little bit more, sow a little bit less, sow it in, in different places. And the more you learn yourself, the more confidence it gives you. So there you go. What I am going to do, exactly the same treatment. I'm going to cover that with the fleece over, but not so much, obviously it won't get carrot fly, but I suffer in this garden from flea beetle. So what I'll do by giving it that protection, that will make sure it it's... But as I say, that's not just in a veg garden, that can be in a pot, be in a border. One more thing to go, I'll see you in a minute. So this is my big project for this year. All the area you can see behind me. I did a little experiment last year and it was about this ornamental kitchen garden I was talking about earlier. And as I said, you know, we grow ornamental currants, we grow edible currants, we grow ornamental rhubarb, we grow edibles. So why not use the edibles a lot more in our gardens, you know, interplanted with our ornamentals? So what you can see behind me are just a series of beds, but this could be anywhere in a border, all right? And I'm building it very much on a layer, so I'm going trees down to shrubs, down to herbaceous, you know, perennials and vegetables, and then my herbs will get added and my bulbs will get added. So what I've done at the moment is a couple of apple trees behind me, and now I'm just starting to go through this area and adding the shrubs. And one of those is a black currant. And for me, I mean, probably black currants and raspberries are my favorite fruit. And what I've done with these beds so far is they have had an awful lot of organic matter dug into them. So unlike, you know, when we're talking about over in the veg garden, I was talking about the sort of idea that it was a no dig approach. Here, they have all been sung single dug. So every single bed has been trenched it's had well-rotted manure put in the bottom and then the trench turned in again. And you know, over a couple of years, you end up with really good, pliable soil. Um, I'll probably only actually do that once in this area. And then what will happen year on year is if you imagine what I'm gonna do with the vegetables growing in different areas, there'll still be like a crop rotation. So once the shrubs are in, the trees are in and the plants are gonna stay every year, there'll be little spaces where I can rotate different vegetables around the garden. Those little areas, I'll probably get either manured, you know, they'll get dug in. And so I am gonna treat it very differently to that space. But when it comes to planting any shrub, really, what you need to do is make sure that your hole is big enough. Um, and what I mean by that is, if you imagine that as the pot size, you know, and, and say two of my fists come to the center, I would make sure that my two fists can fit all the way around my pot. I'll also dig and plant in a square hole. My soil is quite clayey, so if you imagine if I dig around a hole that's just really tight on that pot, I put the plant in, I see the roots just hit the side and keep going round. What will happen here is by the square hole, 
things will root out, they'll get to the corners and then they'll actually fix themselves down into the ground. Now, the black currants really do want that lovely fertile free draining soil, which is exactly what they've got here. You want a sunny position as well. If I tap this round, I thought this might happen. It's really early on in the season. There you go. It's early on in the season. You might, even from the garden centre, you might get home and think, oh, I bought something early in the season. And I bought it home and actually the compost has fallen off. it. That actually, in reality, is not the end of the world. What it really means is probably by July, that would have filled that plant up. But what I've got is, is ultimately a bare root plant now. But that's not the end of the world. So just take this compost back out of here. And because we're still in March, this will grow away quite happily. So I'm going to spread those roots out and then I'm going to start to fill back in. And as I'm filling back in, I'm making sure that there's no real cluds in there. And I can just firm around. I want really good contact with the root systems. And you'll read online, you know, in books, some people will tell you when it comes to black currants to plant at the same height as the pot. Other people will tell you to plant and just bury just above that main stem. What I tend to do is I start off firming it in quite well and probably about the same size pot, same size level, sorry, as, as the pot. What will happen though, over the sort of coming years, is I will slowly bury it because I will mulch really heavily on there. So, and that's it, it's that simple. Now what that'll do is that'll get a really good water in and it'll get away and I'll get some fruit off it this year. And the way that I tend to, you know, approach pruning when it comes to black currants, Actually, I'm a bit lazy. If it fruits really well, I tend to then cut that stem out, take it indoors and pick the fruit off indoors. It's a lot easier than trying to come in here. But at the same time, what you're doing is you're actually pruning the plant. You'll find that they always fruit better on, you know, the sort of younger growth. So as the plant matures, you know, you start removing the older stems and these things will keep going for years and years. Still a bit of protection, you know, netting over, but for me, the taste of your own black currants, mind blowing, absolutely. But you can put it in the back of the border. So give that a go. I'm coming towards you now. So we might end up having to stop this video because I might look like I'm on top of you. Next thing, rhubarb. I've got rhubarb in the veg garden. Um, I love rhubarb crumble, but also this time of year, now I've got some growing for the last three or four years. I force it. So what that means is earlier on in the year, after Christmas normally, going into sort of early February, I cover it up. You could use an old bit dustbin turned upside down. I've got rhubarb forces and um, that was the old fashioned way, ultimately. I've been in some old houses that we've worked, big old houses we've worked at over the years and, and gone down in the basements and seen soil in the basement and then got told that that's where they used to force the rhubarb early on. And what you get by forcing early rhubarb is these beautiful sort of pinky red stems that are so sweet. But you can't do that to the plant every year. So for me, rhubarb's one of those plants that you'll, if you've got space, it's worth having, you know, three plants around the garden because you can force one, one year, you can then leave it for a good couple of years afterwards while you're moving around and constantly forcing other plants. So for me, adding a good amount of rhubarb, if you like it, you know, is a good idea. But again, if you go back to the chard, what I was talking to you about, about, you know, planting, look at the leaf on a rhubarb. It looks incredible. And it's a great thing to plant with. You know, I've planted rhubarb in with things like Iris sibirica. So you've got these wonderful vertical stems, this beautiful flowering plant with these big, broad leaves and they look, absolutely cracking make sure again you know good sort of open well-drained soil lots of organic matter but what we don't want to do here is we don't want to bury that crown too much so each year you will put well rotted manure around it to give it a good feed but i wouldn't be burying the crown because you don't want that to start rotting so we've got that out this again is a plant that's early on in the season so the root system's not really, really built. But if I'm really honest, I could go to areas 
you know, in the garden, I could cut chunks off the rhubarb I've already got, and it would grow quite happily. So, same sort of principle with the hole, make sure it's about twice the size, and we just drop that in, make sure we've got a good height with it. And we'll firm back around. And what is a good idea, maybe, once that's had a water in. So if you have got room to put more than one rhubarb, look at different varieties. You know, get yourself three different varieties. And then you can start to force, get the early ones, and cut the others as main crops through the season. Anyway, once that, as I said, has got some water, that will grow away well this year. I won't pick from that this year. I won't start actually pulling that until the following year. But I do hope that's given you few ideas to get out there and have a go get your hands in the soil enjoy the sunshine encourage a friend but if you're anything like me you know you can't wait now for this garden season to really get going anyway look after yourselves and i'll see you soon